So as these uh, Chris and David have kindly introduced me, I'm a young adjunct professor at the New School. So I teach uh, studio uh, foundations design, as well as this course called Sustainable Systems, which uh, is meant to be kind of a beginning toolkit to understanding sustainability in relationship to design. Uh, we talk about really sexy things like supply chain and cradle to cradle, and all these things that I wish that I had learned as a, as a young art student. Um, and I, I come mostly from a dance background, uh, art history, and then now practice kind of more in, in between visual art performance. Um, so I, my art practice I call Atelier de Geste, the studio of gesture. So I'm very interested in movement as a generator of other things, of spaces, of objects, of drawings. Um, in particular, this year I've been doing a lot of drawing work. Um, you can see some more of my work on the website or social. It's 2018, so I just have to put it out there. So we'll get right to work now. I've been thinking a lot about the Miles Davis philosophy these days. Uh, maybe it's because it was his birthday, uh, May 26th, last week. His spirit is maybe hovering above. It's not the notes you play. It's the notes you do not play. So this philosophy of music, or more broadly, as I like to understand it, this philosophy of presence embraces the space around a note, so what we think of as the negative space, as the more dominant element over the presence of an actual sound or note itself. Indeed, without space around a note, we would not hear music or sound or absorb its oral presence. So this is quite contrary to the mainstream notions in our positivist, capital P, society, which praises and privileges presence, productivity, expression, as dominant and more important over what is conceived of as negative space, the background, the environment, right? Something kind of invisible and abstract, something that we can't really hold. And maybe even is violent towards concepts like quietude or repose. So uh, I want to start with this flip to be the departure point uh, for this kind of introductory uh, broad, ambitious lecture, kind of aiming to structure and theorize this broad theme, body space, um, which has been kind of a lifelong inquiry uh, of mine, precisely because I want to emphasize our own body's contextual space first. That is, its relationship to our spatial, ecological, biological supports as almost more dominant than the body itself, right? That is to say, no living body or living thing exists in isolation and in particular remains continually supported by and dependent on its occupied space and use of the environment. So I was told by Dave and Chris, because they're so cool and think Olio is so cool, that I should uh, prompt you guys to talk to each other. <laughs> So, so my first prompt uh, will take maybe a couple minutes. I think you should give me the cue when it should be over. I don't know. Um, was just to take a couple minutes, if you can find three or four people around you, do you think about your body in space, how it occupies space, and how your body reads in space at all? Or is it, is it something that you just kind of take for granted, like breathing? Um, so yeah, let's, let's take maybe a minute or two if you could engage with your neighbors. That would be really fantastic. <laughs> so we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna come back. Um, wow. Does anybody want to share an interesting story that they heard from their neighbor? OK. Well, maybe we can share them during Q&A. Okay. Um, wow, that was amazing. I feel like I should just stop talking right now and just let you guys talk. Okay, so. The, 
these two are meant to be abstract prompts. I thought that was a nice optical effect to the idea of sound given space, right? So you th through the contrast, you kind of see the vibration between black and white. Um, yeah, I'm not going to explain the other one. Okay. So lighthouses or keywords, some structure to understand what we're kind of uh, delving into. Living, matter, movement. The term living can be understood in terms of contemporary biology in dealing directly with living organisms. Okay, the current definition of life, wait for it, which has changed throughout history and is very controversial due to its, um, well, basically it is based upon the idea of reproduction is as such, summarized from the Oxford Dictionary and Wikipedia 2018, quote, living the condition that distinguishes animals, plants, and other organisms from inorganic matter. The organisms can maintain homeostasis, are composed of cells, undergo metabolism, can grow, adapt to their environment, respond to stimuli, and reproduce. So I would argue that to go further in terms of a metaphysical position, one could also state that all materials and all matter have come from previously living things, such as paper, or fibers, or leather, or pigment. Even plastic coming from petroleum is linked to the organic living mass, right, of the planet, ultimately. Um, I decided to show these two still lives um, because, well, A, I think still lives are magical and amazing. Um, still lives are called nature morte in French which means essentially dying nature, which is really wonderful. Um, I think a still life really aims to capture that space in between kind of the living and the passing of life. Um, so to the left is a beautiful kind of spread of fruit. Some of it is decaying if you look really closely and flowers from the master of Hartford. So this is the early 1600s. Um, to the right is uh, Eileen Gray, who's a phenomenal 20th century uh, designer, um, who I will explain a bit later was um, a pioneer in kind of the anti-Corbusier. So she was kind of aiming for a living architecture, whereas Corbusier was um, arguing for a machine to live in, right? The, the uh, machine à habiter. So this still life to me is quite interesting because it has rigor and modernity, but um, it's kind of off and there's a fragility to it that is touching somehow. Um, and I'll just like leave my little art historical analysis at that. Um, let's go back to movement. So all movement is directly related to force, which is directly related to energy. So this opens up our discussion to an understanding of living matter as an amalgamation also of energy, right? Furthermore, this means that our understanding of living and matter is fundamentally relational as opposed to being isolated or self-sufficient. All energy is transferred from somewhere else in physics, right? There, there can be no new energy generated out of nothing. So I like to call this a radical notion of dependency which uh, is a word that often in our culture comes with a lot of stigma and shame. Um, and here's another prompt so you can speak to each other, which you guys don't seem shy to do, um, is if you can maybe share with each other parts of, a, uh, parts of your life where you are dependent on others or supports in order to function. Um, kind of an engagement with someone or something else that um, you couldn't kind of do without. So we'll take another minute. Yeah? I don't know. <laughs> I am so curious to hear all these stories about, um, I am so curious to hear these stories that, that you're sharing maybe in the Q&A or while we're mingling around. Um, you can share some of these with me. Um, so I don't know what exactly you all heard, but I'm hoping that um, 
your hearing somehow that living necessitates an engagement with one's surroundings and often a fragile dependency with the environment and that living matter is a circulating and symbiotic process. Or to quote American ecologist and co conservationist John Muir, quote, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it attached to everything else in the universe, end quote. So basically this structure of understanding of the world is the basis of what we know today as this school of thought called, quote, biocentrism. Uh, in the last two decades, it's become painfully clear that this positivist human-centric view of inhabiting the world is untenable and destructive. Um, and going back again to our friend Eileen Gray here, um, sh I think her work is gaining a lot of new interest because she kind of espoused this uh, model or this ethos um, in her design as early as the 1920s. So she was already very cautious of this over-reliance on the machine, this over-mechanization of the human being, um, over-productivity, um, and she had a kind of radical notion of uh, rest, and actually in a lot of her design, um, how it manifested itself physically is a lot of the chairs or the, the beds or the architecture of the seating was quite low. So there was kind of a, um, a humility to which you kind of engaged with your space. Um, and also, I think um, her home E1027, which is her most famous kind of work that she uh, co-designed with her partner, Jean Badovici, who was a pupil of Le Corbusier's. So E1027 is, is a very um, kind of sexual architecture, I would almost venture to say, um, and, and, and sexual not necessarily in, in a phallic way. Um, I think that, okay, we, we start going into like gender theory here, but there's a lot of ways to enter the space and it's very fluid and there's not one dominant kind of entry. Um, there's many ways that different levels of people, right? So she was very privileged, she, she had servants, um, could access spaces and the division also between kind of classes was not as um, strong as what would have been built normally in the 20s. So um, yeah, I think as early as a century ago from maybe thinkers like her, th this idea of the dystopia of the machine um, in the essay L'Architecture Vivant, um, she, she really voices very strongly that this ethos of creating machines to live in um, is denigrating to the human spirit and denigrating to human sensuality. And, and you, you sense kind of like almost a personal attack, like maybe because, I don't know, she was a woman working in the field, but that's very like oversimplifying. But I mean, I think she did have this sense that um, the, that the biology of the body was somehow really important to consider. That's kind of what I want to emphasize with Eileen. So let's talk about the body. Um, I would like to quote Paul Valery's Eupolinos, or the architect from 1921. This is taken from Robert Marino's essay called Body Perfect. He's sitting right here, actually. <laughs> Quote, this body is an admirable instrument of which I am sure that those who are alive and who all have it at their disposal do not make full use. They know not what multitudinous bonds with all things they have in themselves and of what marvelous substance they are made. And yet it is through this substance that they participate in what they see and what they touch. They are stones, they are trees. They exchange contacts and breaths with the matter that englobes them. So third and last prompt, I promise. Um, who, who here has like seen the wave in the stadiums? I'm sure everyone has seen that, yeah, okay. So we're gonna do a, not a wave, but you're gonna lean on your partner's shoulder. It's gonna be domino. There's a break in the middle, so if you, why don't you just like reach out and touch hands and that will be your cue. And then when the row breaks, like here, the lady in plaid, I guess you just have to like gently touch the person's knee behind you and then they'll get started. 
So this is kind of a way to embody this idea of the body as an instrument, right? That, that is moving and navigating and gesticulating through space. And this is perfect because I'll have Sasha start <laughs> because she is, um, she is our, my co-speaker tonight. So yeah, go. <laughs> Woo, all right. A living body, and not just the human body, can thus be understood as an organism that is in continual development, evolution, and dialogue. The word, quote, le pli, or the fold, coming from the Baroque philosophy of Leibniz and reappropriated by Deleuze, is a helpful visual in understanding this definition of a living body. Quote, the development of the egg, where numerical division is only the condition of morphogenic movements, Invagination as an endless pleading, end quote. Deleuze le pli, the fold, Leibniz on the Baroque. I think it's quite nice to understand the body as a continual folding or pleating of biological matter, uh, which is sort of what happens on the cellular level. This concept, I think, relates quite nicely to choreographer Lucinda Childs' choreographic score from 1977, which you see on the left depicting group movement in various suites. I like this idea of a fold too because it has something cyclical to it, having to do with usage and refuse, a kind of wild vibration, the idea of materials being cycled back, as opposed to the idea of matter being disposable, which is actually impossible in science and physics. The idea of a continuum, and again, going back to the void, the negative space, right? the space that presence takes up. Okay, so let's interrupt this theoretical programming here for a few minutes with some hard facts. What does it take to support one body in the USA today? Uh, one person on average throws out about four and a half pounds of trash every day. That amounts to about 1,600 pounds of trash per year. So that's the equivalent weight of an adult uh, bull Direct use of water daily is estimated at 100 gallons of water. So that's direct. That's showers, toilets, lawns, uh, drinking water, um, you know, baths. Like the average bath is uh, 50 to 60 gallons of water. So don't take them every day. Um, actually, in New York, we're so water wealthy. So we're actually very, very, very fortunate. The indirect water footprint of daily food and nourishment, so the beer you're drinking, the wine you're drinking, the kale salad you ate, the steak, the pasta, whatever, is estimated at around 1,000 gallons per day. So, um, and there's many other ways that our bodies are supported by uh, our ecosystem, but I'm kind of limiting it to water footprint and trash. Uh, oh, and, and these are from uh, nationalgeographic.com, from a recent study. Uh, yeah, so now jumping back to art, <laughs> the drawings on your right, are, or is it your right? Yes, it's your right, are from uh, one of my, I call him my posthumous uh, art mentor, uh, Oscar Schlemmer uh, from 1924. Uh, they portray the human figure surrounded by abstract geometry depicting to me um, kind of a living web, a body vibrating and orienting in space. And flux is sort of implied, especially in the bottom one, in its dynamism. Um, I sort of get the sensation that I'm witnessing a moment and that it could change and that the before moment and the after moment were very different. And uh, sticking with the Germans, uh, the influential German biologist Jakob van Uxkul, I'm completely butchering his name. It's uh, U-E-X-K-U-L-L. -L. Uh, details in his theory, Umwelt, U-M-W-E-L-T, that all living organisms, quote, cut out the vital circle that suits them in the same way we cut out figures on a sheet of paper. So Umwelt is an established biological theory that is accepted um, in the scientific field. I know because my father is an established biologist and he has said that that is not bullshit. Uh, but Umwelt has recently been more of interest in literature, art criticism, and philosophy. Uh, this image to me of an organism cutting out its life from the fabric of the universe is so powerful. 
The Umwelt theory, which roughly translates Umwelt, that it has no real translation in English, but environment or ecology, essentially states that all living beings' vital circles or their bodies, so vital circle and body is interchangeable here, are subjectively carved out of their relationship with the environment, and no single living thing's Umwelt is the same as another living thing's Umwelt. So if there's an ant in this room, that ant's Umwelt is highly different from mine, although we are occupying the same space. This theory also implies to me that the act of creating one's body, and it's an active act, the active act of creating one's body and vital circle, also has violence to it. It's some sort of choice, cutting out the fabric of the universe, right? So using resources, like there is violence to, to every life. It's, this theory is radical because almost like the Jean-Paul Sartre um, man or woman is condemned because they are free, to live also means that you are choosing your vital circle and that each moment and survival depends upon this choice. So, so choosing brings us to this idea of orientation. Um, I've been thinking a lot about orientation the last couple years. I kind of feel like there's a zeitgeist or something uh, physical and mental where we all sort of feel a bit lost at sea or kind of orienting day to day. Um, the slide on the left is a um, part of a series of drawings that was commissioned this year by the Berlin Biennial that I worked on that had to do with orientation in different scales. So ranging from cellular to human to like astronomical. And this one was one that got rejected, but I really like it. So I wanted to show it to you. Um, so um, art critic, philosopher who's based in Paris, a uh, writer for Art Press, Christophe, um, He's a mentor of mine. He wrote this beautiful text about orientation. Quote, orientation precedes movement. To orient oneself is to direct a movement without necessarily having to correspond to a destination. The distinction that is established between orientation and navigation highlights the absence of a precondition for orientation while navigation depends on the choice of a goal. We could consider, therefore, that orientation is not the contrary to getting lost. Perhaps even the actions of getting lost and finding one's way are both folded into the act of orientation. I think orientation as directly linked to um, body space not just our bodies, but for example, heliotropic plants that orient themselves to the sun, um, more ancient and historical architectural orientations of space um, in relation to the rising and the setting of the moon and the sun. Um, this kind of orientation is really kind of a radical listening to the environment um, in which the umwelt depends. Um, so it's not just like, oh, I'm listening to the planets. You know, it, it, it really is like um, a plant or a being's life depends upon this uh, relationship. Um, I also currently sort of think of orientation as a freedom and allowance to get lost, to take up space that is not predetermined, uh, but that listens to the moment and responds. So in a highly digital and surveillanced world, it may be useful to get back to this fact of the body and its spatial orientation and simply just kind of listen to what that may be. Um, very close to the end here. Yvonne Rayner's No Manifesto, which many of you may know, uh, very catchy and well-written, um, to me was not necessarily radical because of its content. Um, quote, it starts no to spectacle, no to virtuosity, no to transformation and magic and so on and so forth. But I think because her work um, to the right is uh, a group of film stills from her, a famous piece of hers, Trio A. Had the capacity to fully explore the presence of body in a factual way. Um, her piece, Trio A, aimed to strip away the spirituality of Isadora Duncan, the emotiveness of Martha Graham, who was her teacher, so she was biting the hand that fed her to sort of, which I think we all do. Um, and she, I think her work essentially kind of um, gave 
the body as a fact, the body in balance, the frailty of the body, the gravity of the body, a value, an artistic and kind of philosophical value. And I would argue now that in 2018, it is the very facts, the biological facts of our bodily existence and our spatial dependencies that could be spiritual, radical, and transformative. Uh, in fact, not so different from the paradigm shift, um, so Copernicus's heliocentric uh, diagram of the universe, he waited till his uh, deathbed to publish this uh, because the church would have deemed it blasphemous and you know, he would have. Um, not so different from how this view really endowed upon modern history a complete paradigm shift. Um, I do think that rethinking the human's body's place in relation to um, and use of space um, will be a key to, to, to orientation um, now and in the, in the future. Yeah, so that's it. <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. My name is Sasha with difficult surname. Uh, while I will try to set up my presentation, you can try to pronounce it uh, with your uh, partner, I don't know, friend sitting next to you. My surname is Partyanikova. Portyanikova. And please uh, check your uh, friend. Does he or she pronounce it correct? And I'll have a little bit time to, <laughs> to sit down. <laughs> I hope we succeed. Did anyone succeed in pronunciation my surname? Is it okay? <laughs> yeah, so uh, we can train uh, later again. Uh, <laughs> I'm visiting scholar from Russia. I'm also a dance artist as a Biri. And um, um, my, um, yeah, I'll uh, explain a little bit uh, why I uh, did what I've done. <laughs> my dance practice uh, is, takes about 27 years already from my 32. Uh, and um, my first education in biochemistry, second in psychology, and only third in choreography. So I will just uh, uh, take all this material and share with you uh, in order to try uh, to explain how it overlaps together in my mind. Uh, I hope uh, it will be helpful. So, um, uh, the further I uh, do dance and I practice it with my uh, collaborators, with my colleagues, um, I, uh, the more I realize that uh, the main question and issue uh, we try to comprehend is what we know about our body. Uh, and uh, the more I do that, uh, the more I understand that uh, there is no correct answer for this question because the question is wrong. So the, uh, the correct question would be uh, what the body knows itself. And if we will shift, uh, if we will do uh, we'll do this flip. Uh, it will be helpful for us to understand um, what we are doing, what we, why we are doing that, and etc. And how we are moving and how we are thinking. So, uh, in general, uh, if we will start to think about the body, um, I think the most um, established knowledge dedicated to the body is medicine. And um, I think the majority of people is from the Western part of the world. So we know that the Western medicine is started f about uh, 5th or 4th uh, age BC from Hippocrates. And uh, it was gradually continued by other people and for example, everybody uh, know this uh, picture of Leonardo da Vinci. What's crucial for contemporary body knowledge is uh, the fact that 
almost all of them studied uh, anatomy and body on a corpse. So it was dead bodies. It wasn't alive once. And uh, later we'll understand why it's crucial, even more <laughs> than it seems now. Uh, also, we can look uh, to the more older uh, medicines and um, that are uh, seriously more older. For example, Chinese medicine is older than Western one for 2,000 years. And as a, a privileged uh, Western uh, knowledge society, we neglected the knowledge of these body meridians, for example, and uh, <laughs> I don't know, diminished the knowledge because it wasn't be able to prove by our um, system. But uh, what's interesting that uh, the one of the last discoveries of the psychology physiology is fascia. Do anyone know what the fascia is? Please raise your hands. Oh, yeah, that's great. Thank you. So. Uh, we will uh, look uh, for the extract of the cartoon that explained all the rest of the audience what the fascia is. But uh, I'll make this example because uh, our this discovery and this new knowledge... Uh, just a second. Sorry, no, 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 no. Since ancient times, mankind no, has no, tried no, no, to no, understand no, the world that surrounds him. Here? At the Natural History Museum in Washington, D.C., mm. back in the... Thank you. So, uh, I show this uh, cartoon because the fascia that we just discovered several years ago, uh, it, this connective tissue uh, collect our body to that body meridians that we neglect in Chinese medicine. And uh, later we will see that all Western knowledge now became to the point of the uh, elder knowledge that we neglect. So it's just uh, to let you know why I make this. 70s. Yeah. The orthopedic Stephen Levin saw a giant dinosaur with a very long neck. Suddenly, Is it, it hits him. It shouldn't be possible. In a body where muscles and skeleton work like levers, a throat of such length should never cope with the enormous force of gravity. The dinosaur would fall apart. Levin knew that he was onto something, and recalled something that he had read about, tensegrity, a structural principle coined by architect Buckminster Fuller ten years earlier, where hard parts like spells and soft parts like ropes create a flexible force through the combination of tension and stability. Just like the Needle Tower in Seattle, built in 1968, six floors straight up, consisting of almost nothing but air. Levin realized that for the body to work, it needs just this. It's the only model that by itself fits all living organism. He called its discovery biotensegrity, and that changed our view of how the human body is built. New discoveries evoke new insights. The idea of a skeleton as a structure that all muscles and organs attach to and hang upon, where muscles and skeleton work together like mechanics, is obsolete. Instead, we began to look at what surrounds the muscle and the skeletons, studying the connective tissue the fascia. Fascia is a network of connective tissue that encloses everything throughout the body, from muscles and bones to organs and cells. It's like a spider web of hard and soft parts, strong as steel but flexible as threads, just as Levin showed with his biotensegrity. The fascia neutralizes the gravitational force in the body, preventing us from collapsing. It's a complete body block from micro to macro. In 1998, the biologist Donald Ingber showed that even the cell, the smallest element of the body, is surrounded by fascia. The fascia acts as a cell scaffold, which you can read more about in the article Architecture of Life. Yeah. So it's an amazing cartoon, and I'll share it with uh, guys later, if you want to familiarize yourself uh, further with that. Uh, but uh, what's interesting, they just point out that the new discoveries ev evoke new ideas. Uh, we will get these new ideas. Um, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, we go further, and 
Yes, we go. So uh, we already talked about the physiology and uh, fascia connection, and um, what's interesting that uh, this uh, discovery of the fascia uh, told the Western medicine that our system of organs are much more connected than we thought before. So we thought that, oh, I, I'm specialist in digestive system and I'm traumatologist. No. Everything is super connected. So, uh, one more discovery is myroneurons. Who know about myroneurons? Thank you, less people. I'm surprised. Uh, so, myroneurons uh, as oh, th thank you. One more hand. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is a special kind of nerves inside our um, brain uh, that is responsible for these uh, myro actions and uh, if we do something with the right hands hand uh, the uh, neurons who is responsible for the same uh, action on the left hand burning immediately and when um, s uh, neuroscientists uh, discovered that they immediately started to use it in recovery therapy for the people who uh, lost the ability of mo um, muscular control of one of the parts of the bodies, or for example, who left uh, the limbs of one of the parts of the bodies, uh, in order to, they will be able to operate with the prosthesis and all the rest. What's also interesting that uh, these myron neurons uh, work. Um, together with proper exception, what is the uh, one more type of feeling and proper exception is uh, the sense of the motion. So uh, what's interesting that these myroneurons work uh, in the different bodies too. So if you look to someone, do you remember this tricky, uh, uh, I don't know, advertisement from, from the internet? that you do not need to do exercise with your abdominal, you just need to look to someone who do that. <laughs> no, never heard. <laughs> it, it's, yeah, the half of true there are in this uh, sentence because uh, if you did it maybe one month before, uh, your muscles will be burned by these myroneurons and they were, would be actually evoked uh, to, um, to compress. And this um, phenomenon is very, very widely used in uh, sport, especially Olympic sports. For example, they look at different um, sportsmen who do the tricks amazingly great in order to do better. So it really works. And in recovery treatment medicine, they use it too. So uh, what's interesting for us besides <laughs> obvious uh, uh, questions that um, the discovery of myron neurons uh, explain us how the shamans of ancient tribes were able to heal diseased body next to them uh, by the dancing next to them. So uh, Jose Gil in his um, book Metamorphosis of the Body just explained this connection that if uh, there is a person who attune uh, its body in a proper way uh, that he is able or she to feel the other body, he also could be able to heal that body by the dance making next to that. So now it's already proved that uh, this strange knowledge and tradition that we considered as a, something like a bullshit, uh, it was actually the healing approach. So um, as we now on this interconnection of the body and the mind uh, itself, and we came to this, um, I don't know, uh, necessity to consider uh, the ancient, the traditional uh, treatment and traditional knowledge, uh, we can um, look at the Jungian psychology uh, and he uh, discovered at uh, the same uh, the same ideas from the um, from thinking about the conscious and subconscious and unconscious uh, behavior. And um, what's, uh, what he realized that, 
we as a culture beings, culture human beings, uh, have a lot of psychoti uh, psychosis, neurosis, and all the rest. And for example, people from uh, the tribes uh, who uh, preserve the uh, traditional rituals, they do not have the same problems. For example, they do not have the uh, crisis in a teenage of teenagers age so all this distortion that happens in your mind when you became a little bit elder they didn't have these problems uh, because they are less uh, separated with the bodies first and second uh, they have a, a less problem with superego that is morality yeah so the morality the culture uh, requirements and all the rest so um, after all these discoveries, uh, we will <laughs> will come to the Husserl, who told us that uh, in a contemporary uh, decade, I don't know, decade time, uh, we cannot use existing model of knowledge because this existing model of knowledge uh, serve its existing model of knowledge. And when we uh, study subject, we cannot study subject as object. So this existing model of knowledge was elaborated for the studying objects. But when we start to study subject like a person, like a person, uh, social relationships or something else, uh, this model uh, could not be applied because it's wrong. It doesn't work. And what is really work is uh, the um, actual experience, the personal experience, and uh, what's uh, and we need to dedicate ourselves uh, to the studying the subject. To the, uh, we need to study ourselves, uh, our body, our mind, and our way to produce this knowledge. Because the knowledge that we produce uh, reflect the personality of the person who produced this knowledge. Is it a little bit clear? Yeah? Thank you. So, uh, what is resonated for me uh, from this super uh, philosophical um, field with the cellular field, <laughs> uh, the uh, phenomenon of autopoiesis. Uh, Francesco Varela, and I do not remember his name, I suppose also very beautiful, uh, H. Mutarena, uh, two Chilean scientists who uh, discovered <laughs> <laughs> who discovered uh, the phenomenon of, of autopoiesis. We could uh, describe it uh, as, um, as a self-conscious of the creature who have no conscious. So cell itself do not know, uh, does not know what it needs in order to maintain uh, its uh, life. But it produces the proteins, the enzymes, the other, I don't know, molecules in order to maintain it life, its life. Uh, and it even duplicate itself. And all these molecular uh, processes, they are super complex. They're unbelievable complex. But uh, this cell do not have conscious and do not have mind, but it do, does uh, all necessary procedures. Uh, And uh, Varela and Mutarana, they expanded this uh, beautiful theory about autopoiesis of living creatures to human cognition. So they told that uh, we, as a human beings, know ourselves what do we need uh, without knowledge how, how we need to do that. So um, the, uh, the idea is, uh, in order to feel what we need, uh, we just need to uh, reunite, reconnect ourselves with our um, irrational, um, subconscious uh, knowledge and feeling. And uh, it's not easy, because in general we think in a very rational way. Yeah, and our rational uh, uh, 
conscious uh, mind is constructed by the institutions, by the society, by the culture, and all the hierarchical, I don't know, uh, institutions. So, uh, as an artist, uh, as a dance artist, uh, I, um, collaborating with my colleagues, I realized that the most uh, important question, uh, not question, issue, is to shut down a little bit our rational thinking and to evoke a little bit our irrational thinking, I don't know, rain, uh, right hemisphere thinking, uh, intuition if you're not afraid of this word, and uh, all the things. So a little bit balance to uh, hemispheres. And we do a lot of exercises who serve this uh, idea. Today, I propose you to try one of them. Are you ready to do that? So please find the partner. Just turn on to someone who is sitting next to you. Say your name, I don't know, to like introduce yourself a little bit. Yeah, if you have three partners, it's also OK. Yeah? Thank you that you decided to talk a little bit because Next five minutes, we will not talk. We will move each other. So I think you just already uh, introduce yourself and uh, ask your partner, is it OK if you touch your partner? Ask yourself about it. It's like an ethical issue. Yeah? Everybody OK? Yeah? So uh, hold the hand of your partner. Hold both uh, hands of uh, each other. Yeah? Yeah, you are doing great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can do it in a free... Uh, if, if there are more than two people, just make a circle. Yeah, make a circle. It doesn't matter how many people involved. So, are we ready to listen to the instruction? Super cool. So, your right hand now is active one. So, by your right hand, you can manipulate the arm of the partner as much as you can. Please be polite, okay? Uh, yeah? Hand, yeah. And, sorry, sorry, this is not the end. Sorry, sorry, stop. <laughs> your left hand uh, should be super passive. So, the prompt is to allow your partner to manipulate by the, your hand, by your left hand. And, whoo, I haven't finished yet. <laughs> You're so active, audience. We will do that with closed eyes. For three minutes, one. Please listen to me, please, please. Three minutes we will do with the right active hand. I will tell you and now switch. And then your left hand became active and right passive. Uh, and we do other direction, all, also three minutes. Okay? And we do it with closed eyes. Did it, everyone close eyes? Okay? So please close your eyes. Stop talking, please. And here we go. Starts. And we do a little break. And before we will switch the direction, I highly recommend you, strongly recommend you to do not talk to each other when you will do the opposite direction. Just to experience the difference, okay? Do we ready? And we do otherwise. Yes, please share with each other if you haven't done it yet, how you felt, what happened. Uh, did you succeed in this exercise? How do you feel? What is... Please just talk to each other about this common experience a little bit. 
Uh, I want to share with you maybe a three more slides and then we can continue to talk to each other about what happened between us. Uh, just in order to confuse you even more uh, and to share with you my confusion about this world and our body. Uh, I just... Um, know that, uh, yeah, uh, about our DNA and our genome, just to, to be aware that there are from two to three metro meters G DNA in every cell of our body, in every cell, and, the, and we do not know what do we need 98% for that. So just 2% are caught in all these activities and 98% we have no idea what does it do. It's just to, to be aware. And uh, the last uh, discovery that I'm really charmed of is microbiome. Do you, are you know what is it? Yeah, yeah, thank you. So, um, in general, uh, there are, if we take 100% uh, of the cells inside our body, 60, 60, a percent of that is uh, bacteria who live in our guts. So our body is just a 40 percent of that. And if these bacteria uh, do not feel themselves okay, we can have depression and uh, other mind diseases. So it's just, just to be aware. And in the very end, I will share one work of myself. Uh, in order to provoke some of your questions, how all the things connected with choreography and the art. It's from Moscow. Just. Ah, yeah, some context. Uh, it's dance intervention uh, in uh, weekdays, uh, morning rush hours from about 9 a.m. Uh, in uh, suburbs of Moscow. So people just. Uh, running to work and oh sorry ah oh, but i have time to explain so in moscow we have a lot of narrow uh, sidewalks where people move in a two dimensional way uh, even there are no signs who ask them to do that so we did controversial movement so perpendicular group of people just did this something unconventional
that's it. Stop, stop, stop. I will not look at the second time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, there was a series of intervention. If you are curious, you can ask me later. And I think now we have a Q and A. Yeah, me and Biaori. Well, yeah, you're here. Yeah. So if you could wait until you get it before you start speaking, so everyone can hear. We can, we can do the walking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hello. Th thank you very much for the really interesting um, and amazing talks. Um, uh, so, sorry, Speak can you up. hear me? Speak up. Oh, sorry. <laughs> thank you so much for the really interesting and incredible talks, both of you. It's so enriching. Um, I come at this as a, a, a medic and a scientist, so this is all even more interesting and new to me. Um, just out of curiosity, my interest is where in all of this do you think, or do you think it even matters, where does the less able or non-able kind of body and, and movement and function fit into kind of this, well, the spaces that we've been talking about and, and do you think that affects the perception or impact of the, the space around you if your, your body functions differently or less than, than, yeah. I think for the, for the scope of like a living body and dependency, it's probably more interesting to speak of a more dependent body. Um, I haven't worked directly with um, an ill body in my work, but um, I apprenticed under this choreographer named Bill T. Jones. Bill T. Jones Arne Zane, and he's actively worked with um, not necessarily dancers' bodies, bodies who have AIDS. Um, and as Sasha mentioned in her talk about, um, I guess we both did kind of like the definition of a living thing. Um, I think probably to deal with a more vulnerable, bo vulnerable body really puts that in a more meaningful light. Um, in terms of my talk, I would say that uh, we're all sort of sick. I mean, we're making our environment sick, so we are we are all sick. I mean, we're getting there. So it's a very like loaded question. I don't know. I would love to talk with you afterwards about this, yeah. but I think that's all I'll say. I mean, I think it's within the scope of living. It's like this vulnerability, and and in in art, the best codified example we have of that is still lives, because there's always like decay in these images, and there's something really. It's like a humble reminder, right, that we're all these very delicate, fragile kind of creatures. Yeah. That's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could, could do that? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, I focused a little bit uh, on your uh, topic. Uh, you, you ask about the relation with the space too, yeah? And uh, I myself uh, question in a dance practice the um, the question where our body uh, stops and where starts the environment. And uh, we figure out with the colleagues that there is a, also the buffer zo zone that we can also expand or de uh, decrease uh, independent uh, to the surroundings. And um, I totally agree that uh, when we deal with uh, vulnerable body when I myself was injured it's uh, it's absolutely other perception but uh, of the world but it opened up uh, uh, for ourselves the different uh, perspectives and one of the um, aims uh, of uh, 
these practices that I share with you today, for example, is to open ourselves to the uh, mutual vulnerability in order to understand each other better and to, uh, to understand uh, ourselves better. So, yeah, thank you. Hi, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Um, this could be for both of you, but maybe more for you, Sasha. I'm just, I'm curious, um, as far as choreography and dance, what you're working on now, if you have a project or performances or things in the works now? Uh, as I spent the uh, last six months here, teaching in the new school, uh, I have one current um, curatorial project. But no, actually I have. Uh, <laughs> um, after uh, conducting a lot of site-specific interventions in public spaces, um, we with his colleagues figure out that um, people start to pay less attention to this strange activity and even uh, some um, institutions start to invite you to serve the like a festival's events so it became less artistic gesture that we uh, would like it to be so we moved to the web and uh, last six months we maintaining um, the common uh, web dance so four uh, choreographers meet in one uh, con conference call, video conference call, and we do streaming of our common dance. So actually we just miss each other and we want to dance with each other, but we are in different uh, cities. So we Skype uh, and we dance in our living rooms in order to have this ability uh, to share our uh, I don't know how our bodies changes, how our perception of the movement changes. So I think this is the current project that I do. What about your current projects? Yeah. Uh, I've been working for the last couple of years f on a dance uh, imagined in a starless world. So dance done in darkness. Um, again, going to the idea of orientation, navigation. Um, and a lot of the recent art that's been shown has been kind of sets or objects or drawings to buttress that. So um, kind of creating um, retroactive heirlooms um, that kind of depict a relationship with the cosmos that we once had, knowledge that we once had of um, an analemma is a shape the sun makes uh, yearly in the, in the sky. So I've been working on that. It's very abstract. It's very slow. It's going to be very expensive to, to present, <laughs> so it hasn't been presented yet, but I'll let these guys know, and uh, maybe in the next year or two, yeah. Um, I've been also really interested in sound, so I've been working with this amazing artist, Jeremy Toussaint-Baptiste, who um, kind of works with sound architecture, so sound as physical presence, um, and that's actually been as much a choreographic process as physical movement, because it's, it's been so evocative of the body. So that's what I'm working on, but yeah. Hey, uh, uh, hey. <laughs> so I was wondering, you, were s you guys were talking about proprioception mm -hmm. earlier, and uh, you know, it's my personal understanding of proprioception is, is just being able to think, okay, this is my right hand, and you know, being able to feel that your right hand is your right hand, see it and recognize it as something that's yours. And so I was wondering, it's like, what role do you think that plays in uh, the fostering of, say, like mutual vulnerability? Or like, how does it help uh, one kind of, yeah, how do you use proprioception to, you know, create a sense of mutual vulnerability? Uh, proprioception? Mm -hmm. Uh, I would say that uh, it's um, a little bit uh, 
this unsafe area, what we will talk about now, <laughs> because it um, deal with um, uh, negotiation, negotiable. So um, it's not like approved knowledge about uh, justified from the science that we are able to share our body experience with each other. Uh, but I just experienced it several times on our very uh, precise uh, performances of the artists I really appreciate. And uh, I can say that um, some people really attune as uh, that Indian shamans that I showed today. They really uh, spend a lot of time to attune the body to the consider condition. And they became able to share with me uh, the nonverbal experience of the bodies, and it makes me uh, feel such a strange things that make me very curious about what is it, what is going on, what's happening. It's not like a rational, ration, ra rational knowledge or rational things. It's something uh, I would even say danger or like a void or dark part. Yeah, Jan, Jan told uh, about that as a eat, our eat. How could we touch that f through perception, for example, I think. Two things, imaginary pregnancies and women with their period at the same time. Um, if you're a woman and you have a sister it's really strange, like how um, rhythm, like bio cycles can align um, you, sometimes across countries. That's all. I think that's all I have to say to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or if you have a female flatmates, right, yeah. just synchronize some cow. Yes, have you considered how um, bodies or, or people change movement when they change cities or change countries? A yes, very, I Good am. one to world question. <laughs> uh, yes, I am. It's still loud. <laughs> Sorry. Huh? Uh, yeah, me personally uh, really uh, recognize that. So I see uh, it and I even feel it inside my own body. And it's, of course, it's, uh, it's tricky to say I just moved and my body changed. No, I took classes on in this city, in this country, and it made my body and my movement uh, change. Uh, but um, but I think that there are something in the environment itself uh, that I don't know the the river there are a lot of water here for example I'm from Moscow it's it's a struggle to find some water there <laughs> in general so this climate uh, questions and yes I think uh, I even think about the gravity and Coriolis force. Do anyone know about Coriolis force? Yes, yeah, so I think uh, everything influenced to, uh, us. So when I teach or even walk into a classroom, I think I move very differently. Um, I think um, for some reason, I'm really thinking of Chaplin right now. Um, I don't know why. I think, yeah, I think his movement really embodies like role and character so well. And I think what you're asking too is like, how does your socio-political context shape your body? Um, how does it force your body to do certain things? Um, I'm sort of from three cultures, so uh maybe that's why dance was so great to me because it was like hey it's this universal language everyone's got a body um because i think i was like always navigating between 
the Korean and the English and the French and it was so confusing and I couldn't find words for certain things and I knew it in other things and, da, 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 da. and then the body's just like it's such a fact and um, I think yes um, I move differently in the classroom and I move differently at my home um, but part of the joy I think and the beauty of dance and being in the dance classroom, and I can only speak for myself, is there were moments, and I hope there still are, where I felt very sexless and very ageless and very cultureless. Um, just to be a body moving um, was so liberating. And it doesn't always happen. I mean, I have like knee problems and, you know, hangovers <laughs> and all kinds of like social stuff that comes along with having a body. but. Um, I think those moments really kind of define how dance can be transgressive for me. It's just a, a small question, but I, I've been listening to, to, to what you've said. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, just, you see, it's all about beginnings somehow. You're talking about the construction of worlds, of uh, umwelt, of uh, a structure of perception, and how you relate to this through movement, maybe dancing, maybe walking. But what about the end? What about death, for instance? I mean, most of the actor of the authors you're referring to often had uh, one work or one essay or one aspect of their work wasn't on, on death a very important concept in 20th century Occidental philosophy and, let's say, natural science. So how would you relate? You're speaking of Moscow, the only place where I've seen a dead body it was in Moscow. Uh, you're speaking about a non s uh, no stars uh, environment, of silent or dark environment. How would you relate to that? Thank you. Thank you a lot for this question, uh, because, um, I don't know, uh, Maybe you already know about Bhutto dance practice. Do you know about that? Yeah, it's um, Chinese um, Bhutto. Japanese. Oh, sorry. Yes, of course. I don't know why I told Chinese. Of course, it's Japanese. Uh, Japanese culture answer to the Hiroshima. And it was the way how they tried to embody this trauma and to go through that trauma. And they have a lot of... <coughs> exercises that was adopted by the contemporary dance practice uh, when they go through the experience of the death, experience of the dying, and uh, experience of meeting with your ancestors or with the people who you want to meet, uh, to meet you need to talk to them, for example. So uh, all these uh, issues of death is now, for me at least, is the like a uh, topic the most um, the most uh, uh, popular topics of the dance classes so the last workshop that I took two week one week ago was a lot about this dying people how we relate to them how could we heal the trauma that happened on this um, terrain I mean in our countries and what we will do with that because we just cannot forget about that and what we will do with our own death so uh, we deal with that but uh, I'm not sure that I'm uh, enough um, experienced yet to uh, in include it in my uh, presentation <laughs> So I decided to be a dance major in college because my mother was terminally ill. So um, she's still here, but uh, it was a very real kind of fact, like going again to this fact of the body. And I apologize actually if it wasn't clear enough in my like still life thing that um, that I I think basically like the act of moving and living always implies a terminus um so to me at that young age um 
my mom's body was very traumatic and I figured, um, I mean, I, I came to the school very interested in the dance major, but I thought it would be a minor. And it was a way to kind of, um, I don't think to heal. It was a way to kind of um, fight, um, I can't even find the right word. There is no word. Yeah, I, I think it was a way to be present, essentially. And if, if there's a way to relate it, to maybe it's um, something with this living being actively choosing to make its living circle. Um, dance kind of helped me do that in that moment, and then it just kind of like stuck with me. <laughs> but yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah. Uh, I just want to add that uh, maybe uh, I used very tricky words. Uh, for example, on, on that workshop, we used uh, fake healing rather than healing because there are a lot of questions about could we heal people who are already okay? And uh, as to this dance uh, death experience, there is an amazing artist in here in New York who work in a, she has two um, occupation. One, she is a dance artist, and the second, she work in a hospice, and she facilitate people who are dying. And she do not uh, consider one of these parts as the uh, Permanent, so the both are the same is important, and uh, the quantity of uh, this kind of artists increase from year to year. So I think, yeah, it's thank you a lot for this question.